Bocsánat, ahogy... Hey, thank you all for uh, joining us, and I'm happy to have with me Attorney General Bill Sorrell, my Commissioner Susan Dunnigan, and my Secretary Pat Moore. Thanks so much for coming. We're here today to dis discuss two coordinated actions that have been filed by the State of Vermont and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission concerning the EV-5 projects in the Northeast Kingdom, run by Ariel Kuros and Bill Stenger. The SEC has filed an action in federal court in Miami, which freezes the assets of Mr. Kuros, who is a resident of the state of Florida. The federal court has also granted the SEC request to appoint a receiver to manage these projects while the litigation is pending. The state has filed a complaint in Washington County Superior Court that raises allegations very similar to the SEC's. The state filing is a result of over a year's work by the Department of Financial Regulation, which has worked very closely with the Vermont Attorney General's Office and the SEC. And I want to thank profusely the good work of the Department of Financial Regulation, my commissioner, as well as the great work of the Attorney General's Office. The complaint alleges that starting in 2008, over $200 million of an investor funds intended for EV-5 development projects in the Northeast Kingdom were misused and that Mr. Kuros misappropriated an additional $50 million of investor funds for his own personal enrichment including over $20 million to purchase JP and Cuba resorts, over $2 million to purchase an apartment at Trump Place in New York City, as well as a million dollars, as well as millions of dollars to pay for personal taxes and other personal expenses. The fraud allegedly began on day one when millions of investor funds intended for EB-5 projects at JP, the Tram House Lodge, and the J Hotel and Pump House were used instead to purchase JP Mountain way back in 2008. For many years, dating back into the late 1990s, the oversight and promotion of the EB-5 Regional Center in Vermont was hosted at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. That is the system that was in place when I became governor. As EB-5 projects in Vermont grew and became more popular, more expansive, and more complex, I realized the need, I realized that we needed a better system that didn't ask one state entity to simultaneously promote and oversee the EB-5 programs. So in September of 2014, I asked the Agency of Community Development and the Department of Federal Regulation to develop a partnership to strengthen Vermont's oversight. In December of 2014, that relationship was formalized, bringing DFR's financial and securities expertise to the oversight of the EB-5 projects statewide. Shortly thereafter, DFR began their work reviewing the projects in the Northeast Kingdom. Over the course of more than a year of diligent work, they carefully tracked the alleged misappropriations and misuse of investor funds that we're here to talk about today. That alleged fraudulent activity began in 2008, three years before I became governor. I'm grateful to Commissioner Donegan and to the team at DFR for so effectively implementing this improved oversight system and for their extensive investigative work. This is obviously a very difficult day for Vermont and for the many people 
myself included, who are so invested in growing jobs and economic opportunity in the Northeast Kingdom, the part of the state that has lagged behind the rest of the state in job creation for as long as we can all remember. Most of all, this is a difficult, this is a difficult day for the hundreds of employees, hundreds in the Northeast Kingdom, who rely on Jay Peak, Hugh Burke, and the related projects to support their families, projects that appeared to hold so much promise. My commitment as governor is to do everything that I can to protect these Vermonters' jobs and the investors who are the victims of these allegations, as well as to ensure that we do all that we can to make the very best of what is a terrible situation. The federal court has appointed a receiver, Mike Holder of Miami, to oversee and, and administer the assets of the EB-5 project named in, the, named in the complaints, including the Jay Peak Resort. Mr. Goldberg's team has been on the ground in the Northeast Kingdom taking control of those projects. I and the Attorney General's office have already been in communication with a receiver whose expertise is to manage difficult situations like this, to ensure that the best possible outcome for the Northeast Kingdom and those Vermonters employed by these projects. I just got off the phone with Mike Goldberg, and it is his intention, as much as possible, to maintain normal operations of the affected businesses and keep Vermonters working there. I'm grateful to those efforts, and therefore we do not expect significant job losses as a result of today's actions. Now I'd like to turn this over to Commissioner Susan Dunnigan to describe DF DFR's work to date, then to the Attorney General to outline allegations in the state's complaint, which was just filed, and finally to Secretary Moulton to talk about how these allegations impact the regional center. Following those remarks, we're obviously happy to take questions. I also want to apologize in advance for the tardiness of this press conference. We were unable to discuss these issues until the complaint filed by the SEC was released by the federal judge in Miami. That happened about 45 minutes an hour ago. So uh, I'll turn it now over to Commissioner Dunnigan. Commissioner, thank you for your extraordinary work. Thank you, Governor. My remarks are going to focus on how the Department of Financial Regulation, DFR, arrived at the allegations in the complaint. Before I start, this is a little chat with the media, um, I just want to remind you that DFR has important confidentiality protections to follow. Those of you who have covered our stories previously know this, so if I answer a question later on, where I say, I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer that question, or DFR neither confirms nor denies, I know that you'll understand. EB-5 is a federal visa initiative designed to give foreign investors a legal path to obtain United States residency. They do that by investing in certain projects that create US jobs. The program here in Vermont is unusual in that the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, ACCD, is one of two active regional centers in the country that are government run. The program here in Vermont is also unique in that we are the only state that has its securities division in partnership with its regional center. So with ACCD and DFR on the job, Vermont investors can be confident that there is a rigorous review of EB-5 projects. We now apply more scrutiny to EB-5 projects than any other center in the country. But why is DFR involved? Well, to participate in an EB-5 program, a foreign national invests money in a project. The investments we're talking about today under the J umbrella are in the form of limited partnerships. Limited partnership interests are securities, and DFR is the chief regulator of the state's securities laws. If you recall, my jurisdiction covers banking, insurance, and securities. In early 2015, 
DFR began to focus on the JP properties in part because the principals asked to raise more money, first for the ANC Bio Clean Room Limited Partnership, and then for the Kuberk Hotel. As DFR began its financial reviews of those two projects, we saw anomalies and unusual transactions that raised regulatory concerns about how all the investor money across all the projects, not just ANC Bio and Q Burke, but how all the funds were transferred and accounted for by Mr. Stenger, Mr. Kiros, the limited partnerships, various companies, and related entities. I'm going to give you a picture of what I'm talking about. I have two charts with me here today. I'm sorry for the folks in the back. You may not be able to see them right away, but we will leave them here for you to look at. These are for illustration purposes only. These are not formal exhibits. But I want to give you an image of what we allege has been going on. I'm, in your, I'm going to try not to be in your way, but we're going low tech here today. <laughs> This chart is what I call anticipated flow of JP EB-5 investor funds. This is what DFR expected to see in its financial review when it started to look at the flow of funds. It's a fairly straightforward picture. Money comes into a project, it goes out of a project, and each project is distinct. So we have eight projects. Phase one, phase two, penthouse, golf and mountain, the Lodge, Stateside, ANC Bio, and Q Burke. When an EB-5 investor sends their money, it should go right into an escrow account, and it's kept there until certain conditions are met when the money is then released into an operating account. That operating account is then used to pay the expenses of the project, develop the property, and, and finish the project. Each one of the projects is to be discrete, as you see, and that uh, the flow is, is easy to follow. Okay? However, as DFR pulled the pieces of the financial puzzle together, we saw something very different. Instead of what you just saw in the first chart, call this the spaghetti map. We saw something very different. We saw a complex web of financial accounts that allegedly facilitated the improper commingling, misuse, and diversion of funds between EB-5 projects, related companies, and personal accounts. Now, on this chart, each colored box represents a financial account, like a bank account or a brokerage account. And those are controlled by Mr. Stenger, Mr. Kiros, the companies, related entities, and the limited partnerships. The black lines, you'll see that the black lines go out through the entire chart and connect the various financial accounts. Those black charts show the routing of investor money between the accounts. DFR tracked <coughs> over 100 accounts at 10 financial institutions involved in the scheme. So just to compare the images again, anticipated flow over here of the funds, very clean, in, escrow, operating, out, versus our image on the chart on the other side, which shows an unrestricted pool of money that we allege was transferred between projects indiscriminately and was used as a personal piggy bank. This is what we allege fraud looks like. Now I know you've not had the advantage of reading the complaint. Can you go back to the microphones please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought my voice was loud enough. <laughs> All right. So I'll just repeat that the chart on the left I wait until I get the... Okay, everybody all right? 
All right, so let me just go back and say that the chart on the left shows what we call the actual flow of funds, but that's what we allege fraud looks like. Now, I know you've not had the advantage of reading the complaints closely, but I would say to you that those documents tell the story of the flow of money that's in the diagram on the left. Now, as the governor mentioned, uh, it took a year's work for us to get to this moment today. My legal staff and the securities division painstakingly gathered and analyzed extensive financial records and other documents. 64 subpoenas were issued by DFR, and in the neighborhood of 300,000 documents were gathered. People often ask me, what do you do at DFR? <laughs> well, this is what we do, and this time it's resulted in a complaint that alleges hundreds of millions of dollars of securities fraud. Now these charts, the complaint, some questions and answers, and links to more information are going to be live on the DFR website. If they aren't already now, they will be momentarily. I believe that address is in the press release, but I'll give it to you folks again just to make sure you have it. www.dfr.vermont.gov. Vermont is spelled out. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Commissioner. Susan, can we switch to, to one from one tripod to the other? Attorney General Bill Sorrell. Thank you, Governor. After having received approval from the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C., uh, late last week, on Tuesday morning, SEC enforcement attorneys filed an approximately 80-page complaint in federal court in Miami against Ariel Quiros, Bill Stanger, JP Inc., Q Resorts Inc., those being the owners of the two ski resorts, and all of the JP related EB-5 projects in the Northeast Kingdom, with the exception of the Cuber Hotel and Conference Center project. The complaint alleges civil as opposed to criminal violations of federal securities laws. The federal government asked for and obtained authority to freeze various of Mr. Quiros's personal assets, and a receiver was appointed to take control of the Jay Peak and Burke Mountain resorts all of the defendant EB-5 projects and certain related entities. Mr. Stanger and Mr. Quiros, pursuant to the federal court order, are prohibited from involvement in any EB-5 project. Counsel to the receiver, accompanied by more than a dozen associates, were in Vermont as of Tuesday, and yesterday afternoon, they commenced their duties to manage and operate the projects and companies under their control. The SEC case was filed under seal, meaning it was filed in secret, without notice to the defendants. Earlier today, uh, as the governor said about 45 minutes ago or an hour ago, we received notice that the federal court lifted the seal. And consequently, a very short time ago, the state under my authority and the authority of uh, Commissioner Donegan filed a complaint in Washington Superior Court against the same defendants as in the federal action. Our case also alleges civil violation of state securities laws and additionally violations of our state consumer protection law. The state and federal lawsuits, as you review the complaints, you'll see they are similar, uh, but not identical. They each allege the misuse and commingling of hundreds of millions of dollars of investor funds raised in conjunction with the EB-5 projects. Further, they allege that Ariel Quiros unlawfully converted to his own use approximately $50 million of investor funds. Mr. Quiros allegedly used these funds for a variety of purposes, including his purchase of the J. Peak and Burke Mountain Ski Resorts, 
payment of millions of dollars of his income tax obligations, and the purchase of a New York City Trump Place, New York luxury condominium. The defendants, if found liable, will face no jail time. They could, however, face substantial financial penalties, restrictions on their future business activities, and forfeiture of ill-gotten gains. Our top priorities, however, are protecting investors' interests, keeping businesses at the resorts operational, opening the Q-Berg Hotel and Conference Center, and otherwise ensuring that justice is served. We have not, in our filing, sought the appointment of a state receiver to control Cooper Hotel and Conference Center. We have been in communication with Mr. Goldberg, the federal receiver, and have received his assurances that a high priority for him and his team is a potential expansion of his federal court authority to exercise control over the hotel project. If this expansion of authority is not obtained from the federal court, we stand ready to expeditiously seek such control for the federal receiver from the Washington Superior Court. Uh, as the commissioner has suggested, we will make links to the court filing, state and federal, on our office website, or links over to the DFR website, where I believe the, the federal filings uh, will be. Let me just say that this is not a depiction of a simple bank robbery. Rather, this depicts what we allege to be a massive and complex fraudulent enterprise. It is very early in what will likely be lengthy litigation. As we and federal authorities learn more the litigation could broaden and deepen. State and federal judicial and enforcement decisions will likely dictate the timing and course of the lawsuits. Let me close by making clear that without the very competent and careful financial investigation by the Securities <coughs> Division of Commissioner Donegan's department. Today's state court filing, and quite possibly Tuesday's federal court filing, would not have happened. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Bill Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Certainly, this is a sad day for the Northeast Kingdom. We all had such high hopes for the variety of projects there, and if these allegations are true, unfortunately, only a portion of the vision will become a reality. But clearly our first concern is with the people who work at these resorts. And as the governor had said, we understand the re receiver put in place indicates the resort will remain open and the jobs will remain in place. The Jay Peak Resort is open and will remain open. I want to reiterate that the partnership between ACCD and DFR assures more oversight than most regional centers in the country because we are government run and we involve our securities regulator. This partnership between ACCD and DFR assures investors in Vermont projects there is rigorous review of our EB-5 projects. We have more scrutiny than any other EB-5 regional center in the country. Today's action, I want to be very clear, does not affect any of our other EB-5 projects. Those projects are proceeding. Investors in these J-related projects should continue to file appropriate petitions for their citizenship status. The, the appropriate petition being an, either an I-526 or 829, and they will, those, the adjudication of that process will continue as usual. I've spoken to the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service, and they indicate that each investor's petition will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And our Vermont Regional Center is still open and very much promoting the other EB-5 projects we have here in the state. And after that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Secretary Moulton. We'd be happy collectively. Come on Attorney General Sorrell, yeah, you, you mentioned that there's just a civil matter at this point. Is a criminal investigation either ongoing or forthcoming? Uh, first of all, uh, I would refer you to the U.S. Attorney uh, 
in reference to any federal action. I will say that at this point in time, no state criminal prosecution is contemplated. Governor, where is um, Ari Kiros the son? What is his status at this point? Yeah, you'd have to ask Ari Kiros the son. Uh, I really have no idea. The, the executive staff was not, it sounded from the original uh, statement that the, the executive staff at Kubert was replaced. So uh, we should really probably refer to the receiver for questions about who has been replaced. Uh, all I can tell you is if you read the federal complaint, you will find that Q. Burke is not the focus of their main inquiry. It's very important to know that. With the um, patent on the communication we've received through the FOIA, et cetera, uh, money was still being given to Bill for Q. Burke fairly recently, uh, long after your suspicions. Why was that under, why did you continue with that? Well, Susan <laughs> That was actually Susan was releasing the money, not overseeing. It was her it's, department. And it's so not really the money, cars. it's approval. It's approval. Right. Right. So as you know, Kubrick investors um, in the what I call the second amended private placement memorandum, and for those of you that have been following this case, you know what I mean. New investors were required to have their money placed in escrow until uh, permission was granted to release that money by DFR to make sure that investor money went to appropriate building and uh, property expenses. So we continued to allow the hotel to be built. It was already started. And that was one of the things that was important to us when we as, at DFR saw when we came on the job that um, the Kubert Hotel had already started. And so for an asset um, preservation, which is very important for investors, because that ultimately creates jobs, which is the point of this, we wanted to make sure that that asset was de developed appropriately. So we, the oversight that we put towards the new investor money that came in was to make sure that those expenses went to the right job. And so we allowed there to be, after great scrutiny, and we have uh, you know, experts that were helping us to make sure that the money went to the right part of the project, we allowed investor money to be released um, on a sort of a monthly basis or so. You've been following this. You saw that we allowed certain building materials to be purchased, the labor, certain permits to be paid for so that we could get here today where we have actually an asset for a receiver to take over. There's also a lien on that asset right now, which is that lien is going to come to court if it's not fulfilled, so there's still some money to pay to the general contract. Well, you know what? This is going to all go out into in, in the legal system at this point, and I think that we're going to have to let the legal system work its way. What happens to the investors? How do they get their money back? Are, are they going to get their green cards and pay the well, as the commissioner said, we have to let the legal process play out, but USCIS is very clear that investors should continue to, to file petitions, and they will continue to adjudicate is their reference to those petitions. It's way too early to know how any funding or money refunds might occur, but investors are encouraged to continue to file the appropriate petitions, and each will be considered case by case, so we won't know until all those adjudications have occurred. This has been going on for eight years. Why, why did it take the state so long to figure out what was going on? You know, uh, I think it's important to remember that the EB-5 program is pretty new. And, you know, it's not something that's been around for decades. Having said that, we are learning as we go. And, you know, EB-5 started out pretty small in Vermont. Let's not forget, we had some pretty successful projects to uh, believe, have everyone in Vermont, prior to my becoming governor, to be enthusiastic about the EB-5 program. And uh, you know what some of those projects are, but they were quite successful. Uh, having said that, it was when we started hearing complaints from investors uh, and uh, started to hear rumblings from some that they weren't happy, that it occurred to me and others that it seemed inappropriate that we were asking our hardworking regional EB-5 center 
not specific projects, but the center, at the same time that they were supposed to be giving investors assurances that uh, we were scrutinizing the projects as much as we were allowed. So we made the move when we did. You could certainly argue that we all wish, I bet, that previous governors had made that move, that I could have made it sooner. Uh, but we made it, and these were the results, that it worked. Governor, when did it become clear to you that there was a problem here? So I started here, I should say that uh, when DFR started really, was really able to look into the projects, at a level I want to be clear that we had never been able to look at projects before. Don't forget, DFR has powers that ACC does not have. So uh, as Commissioner Dunnigan and her team started digging in and asking for information, and they were having difficulty getting that information, uh, I started hearing, hey, they're asking questions about how money's flowing, what's happening, and they're not getting cooperation. I sat down in September of 2015 with Commissioner Dunnigan, with the partners, to say, team, you know, we're not here to hurt you. Please share us with us the information we need to do our work. And uh, when we were still having difficulty getting information after that, that's when DFR started really digging in. At that point, I started hearing rumblings uh, from my department that uh, they had some real concerns with what they were finding. I said to them, do your job, do it well, do it thoroughly, and as soon as you are able, make a presentation to me about what you found. And they did that in September of 20... I'm going to help you with the things. I'm going to help you yeah, with the go things. Ahead. <laughs> there are an awful lot of details, as you can see. Um, when DFR in, in January, February realized that we were seeing some of the uh, improper transactions and, and we had questions, one of the things that we started to do was to try to get more information. And that's when the governor in early 15 started hearing me say, I, I'm not... Yeah, 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 yeah I'm seeing, um, you know, need, a need for more cooperation. Um, by, um, by that time, we, I certainly have been working with his staff and helping them understand what the problems were that I was seeing. By, um, so that was sort of March that the governor's office was let know that I was needing um, some more understanding about what was going on. So I would say around that time is the first time you heard of the concern. However, it wasn't until September 10th that we gave the governor a full briefing on what we had spent the entire summer um, doing a deeper drill and deeper dive into figuring out what the problems were and what we thought potential allegations might be. So the answer is I started hearing rumblings in March. We met with the investor to say, get us the information we need. Uh, and in September, they made a full presentation to me. What does the receiver not have control of? Uh, they don't. <laughs> the receiver has control over all of the defendants, and if you look at the front page of the federal complaint, some related entities that would appear on, on this document or uh, this depiction. Uh, but. All of the EB-5, JP, Northeast Kingdom EB-5 projects, with the exception of the Burke Hotel and Convention Center. But as I indicated in my remarks, we have been in touch with the receiver. He has assured us it's a priority for him as he goes about his duties to see whether it's appropriate for him to ask the federal court to also give him control over that EB-5 project. And if that federal court authority for the receiver over that project is not readily forthcoming, we will file in Washington Superior Court up the street asking that a receiver be appointed over the resort and uh, conference center. Do you know why it was exempted? So what, you mean Q-Burk? Yeah, the hotel. <clears throat> so I think it's important to note that uh, Q-Burk was the only ongoing project uh, that DFR, that was involved in DFR's investigation. So it was a little different than the other projects, which either had primarily happened or were about to happen. You know, money was not being spent at ANC Bio. Money was not being spent at the Newport downtown revitalization. So we had a slightly different challenge there. And what we did was, 
very carefully scrutinized that the dollars were spent meeting the, uh, the outline of the investor's expectations. Commissioner Donegan did that very well. We were trying to do three things, protect the jobs, protect the investors, and ensure that in the end, the investors would be in the best possible shape to get to be in a good financial, as the best financial position as possible. So I would suggest that because uh, this, the commissioner was scrutinizing those expenditures along with the Secretary Moulton and their team, that it performed better or uh, differently, more appropriately than some of the earlier investments. What and, 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 there, and therefore, it wasn't mentioned in the complaint. Right. And, and as I indicated before, we're early in this case. Yeah. And as we learn more, as federal investigators learn more, there could be expansion to the existing complaint. There could be other named uh, defendants. Uh, we're, we're early in what's going to be a very long process. Chief Burke Resort is under receivership. The resort is under the control of the receiver. The hotel and conference center is not at this point. But we expect that to be under a federally, the federally appointed receiver soon. And if that doesn't happen, we will be asking uh, the Superior Court, Washington Superior Court, to put a receiver over that project. How is alleged fraud of this magnitude not criminal? I didn't say it's not criminal. You I said, said there was no I consideration said, yet for criminal I charges here in Vermont. I said at this juncture, uh, we do not contemplate filing state criminal charges. That could change. We have been working very hard. In the case of my office, we received the briefing similar to what the governor received in September. We received that briefing in, uh, I think it was August 10th. And let me just say that there is no matter in the AG's office that has gotten more attention and more of our resources since August 10th than this case right here. What role did state officials play in encouraging foreign investors to put their money into these ill-fated projects? Well, you know, I think there's been bipartisan agreement uh, in Vermont uh, among not only elected officials but legislators that uh, the EB-5 program helps a small rural state get capital to do projects that otherwise wouldn't happen. And it's been a pretty good partnership for Vermont. Uh, needless to say, uh, I as governor and former governors uh, have promoted EB-5's, Vermont's EB-5 Regional Center uh, with, with enthusiasm. I mean, the dream that we could finally create hundreds and hundreds of jobs in the part of the state that has been struggling for jobs is something that any reasonable person would wish to pursue. <coughs> Having said that, uh, obviously this is an extraordinary disappointment. Uh, we all feel betrayed. It's a dark day for Vermont. A lot of us uh, uh, are not only proud of the fact that, let's not forget, some of these projects have happened. I mean, Jay Peak is a booming business right now with a water park, with improved mountains, with improved golf course with improved accommodations. That's an ass not an asset that's just going to dry up and go away. And that's why I'm optimistic that those jobs, and to answer Ann's question, those EB-5 credentials should not, in, in any scenario that I can think of, be significantly compromised going forward. So, you know, uh, obviously, we can all sit here and say, you know, who should have do done what, when differently. And we have done a lot of inner searching in my administration over the last year as this has become obvious, more obvious to us. But I think the answer is uh, that, you know, at the heart of it, there's a certain amount of trust in the partnerships that we have with the private sector and government. And we have found through the process we've set up that that trust was misplaced, allegedly misplaced. How would you, how would you characterize your relationship with Ariel Kuros before you learned about what was going down? Well, you know, I tried to help this project in every and similar ways that other elected officials across Vermont have done, both those.
those that are serving now and those that served previous to me. Uh, so, you know, I don't, all I can say is, I don't think there's a governor in America who uh, wouldn't try to help create jobs in a part of the state that is really hurting for jobs. You've accepted tens of thousands of dollars of contributions from Mr. Kiros and Mr. Stanger and their various companies over the years. You traveled abroad to raise money for this. Um, do you, and in fact, you cited Mr. Stanger at one of your state of state or inaugural addresses. Um, do you regret the close ties that you forged with them? Uh, and do you think that you could have done anything differently personally? Not talking about your, your process? Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything that I could have done differently previously without knowing the facts. And I think it's a testament to the fact that campaign contributions don't make a difference that I set up the structure that went in and found this out and brought us to where we are today. So having said that, uh, I think that it is because of the actions we took, not despite the actions that we took, that we're standing here at this moment. And that is not discoveries that other governors made while the programs were running in Vermont. Having said that, of course I regret. I think all of us have tremendous regret that we're standing here today uh, in a program that had so much promise and having to outline these allegations, it's a really bad day for Vermont. But should you have changed that structure earlier in your administration? That, that structural change is not made uh, for at least four years, if I'm not mistaken, into your administration. Uh, you know, Paul, you can quarterback this one all you want. All I can tell you is uh, there had been no complaints about projects, EB-5 generally across the state, that I can recall from any investors to any governor, me or prior ones, until the complaints that we started hearing about. As soon as we saw those complaints, I looked at the structure with my team <coughs> and said, you know, we could probably do this a lot better. Talked to DFR, they said, yeah, we have the power to actually go in and see what's going on financially in these projects. That's what we did, and I think that's why we're here today. Did you have personal relationships with these guys? Well, only... Just so you know, Mr. Kuros wasn't on the trip to Asia that I went on to promote the EV5 program. But did you hang out with him socially outside of the out of that universe? I don't hang out socially with any of the EV5 uh, principles. No. Governor, even if this alleged Ponzi-like fraud is proven, is Vermont still a beneficiary having given that we do have assets that are here? So does Vermont benefit whether this is fraud or not? I think that it would be remiss for us not to recognize that with all the tragedy that we, and, and, and unhappiness and disappointment that we're talking about today, that JP has succeeded in building out infrastructure that's made it a stronger business, that's created jobs and economic opportunity for Vermonters. And you know, uh, that's the reason that Governor Douglas traveled to Asia and went and, and uh, you know, went to the ANC bio plant in South, in, 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 uh, South Korea at, the point, at that time and signed an MOU to bring a, an ANC here. That's why I went to Asia to try and promote Vermont's EV5 Regional Center. Uh, it's, a great, it's, it's been an extraordinary story across Vermont. I guess the, the heart of my question is, would the Northeast Kingdom be in worse economic conditions if we had recognized the alleged fraud earlier? Oh, I, I have not contemplated that question, so this Bill, is a tough one to answer. Bill, Bill Stenger was... I don't know if we'd ever know the answer to that one, truthfully. Uh, overseas as recently as two weeks ago trying to convince people to give him money for these projects. Why was that allowed to happen, given the knowledge of what was happening with those funds? One of the reasons why the state agreed to hold off filing our complaint until the federal court had filed and its complaint was unsealed was that the federal government is much more facile than state government in freezing tens of millions of dollars of assets in many different financial institutions and other locations. And so it was the better course for us to protect investors and protect the integrity of the case to allow the federal government to go forward. So it was their timing that really dictated this. And 
uh, when they told us they were finally ready to go to the SEC, to the commission in D.C. last week, we've known that for a few weeks. And what has been a race became warp speed just within the last few weeks. So was the idea you didn't want to tip him off to what you were on to? I mean, you got this guy's about to be indicted on these crazy fraud charges, and there he is making his pitch to investors in South Africa saying, give me, well, a, give me a half mil. We have the protections through the agreements that any funds raised, whether for the, the Cuba resort, uh, the commissioner has control over that, and similarly, we have control over the ANC bio funds. So we were have not been worried that this kind of uh, enterprise was continuing. Rather, in the more recent past, for both the uh, Cuba project and for ANC Bio, in the most recent past, it looks much more like this than this. So we've had that degree of assurance. Has it been frustrating? Would we like to have moved more quickly? Yes, but again, a tremendous amount of work has gone in on both federal, the part of state and federal officials to get to today. And is the idea that these projects are going to remain EB-5 eligible and that there's just going to be a new new person taking over ownership and Wait. they're going to continue to try to get the money they need to bring them to fruition? I think that it's difficult to lump them all, lump them all together and the answer is we do not know the answer to those questions. But I think you can assume that ANC Bio and the downtown Newport project, the projects that have never gotten off the ground, uh, will not happen. But you have a demolished block. Let me just mention by sorry. Will not happen. Having said that, one of the hopes for all of us as we watched, as, as we were doing the investigation, and the one project that was undergoing construction was actually going forward, which was Q-Bird. It helps the investors in that project to get to the point where it can open, obviously. So each project is different, uh, and each one has a different future. And is it, is it fair to say that state officials encouraged foreign investors to invest in these projects? I think it's fair to say that state officials, governors, uh, all of us have promoted Vermont's EB-5 regional center with as much enthusiasm as we can because we believe that the scrutiny that we bring to these projects gives a higher level of confidence that we might find something is wrong if it's wrong than in the states where there is no state involvement. And the state has required that there be amended uh, placement memoranda, in other words, the documents that are provided to investors, uh, to new investors, as well as to existing investors to reflect the fact of the SEC investigation so that investors past and investors going forward would have more disclosures as to uh, what has been going on, uh, at least in terms of SEC scrutiny. That's an important point. In plain English, nobody was investing in an EB-5 program under this management that didn't know that an SEC investigation was taking place based upon the requirements of the department to disclose that information. Or if it did, it happened behind our backs. Let, but that, let me clarify that. New money right. that was raised for ANC Bio and Q Burke. So the, the, but that's what they're asking. That's what you're asking about is the new money that was raised recently for both those projects. Remember, ANC Bio's money was put into escrow and it's still there. Is that project the recent, money. the recent ANC Bio money was put into escrow, that's still there. The new money that was raised for Q Burke also went into escrow and none of that was released without a signature and approval from DFR. And was there any I just want to add to that it's, it, it, it's very clear in the EB-5 program that the regional center does not promote the project, we promote the regional center, as the governor has said. And USCIS, Customs Integration, is very clear that these are at-risk investments. And their website encourages each investor to hire their own counsel and do the due diligence. And that has been our message to investors, is we have great projects, you need to do your due diligence, make your determination over what investment fits your profile best, but that you should be carefully scrutinizing the PPMs, hire your own counsel, 
to make sure you're making the right decision. But these are at-risk investors, and EB-5 is about at-risk investment. So Dan's question was, what's going to happen to that hole in the ground in Newport? Newport? You know, we obviously want to work together with the legislative delegation with the folks in the kingdom to make the best of a bad situation, but I think it's fair to speculate that uh, the EB-5 program that was envisioned for both downtown Newport and for NC Bio certainly won't be moving forward. Which and I just want to make clear too, there is a permit condition on that project that if the construction hasn't commenced by September 1st, 2017, they have to fill it, grass it, and turn it into a park. So that is a permit obligation for the projects. Who has to do that? Who? The permittee, which in this case is the Q Burke and um, JP Developments. The exact title owner I can't tell you, but that is a permit requirement. But understand, it's the federal receiver who Who's controls gonna... those entities. Right. So if the park or anything else is going to happen, it's going to be through the federal receiver. And again, Ariel Quiros and Bill Stanger, under the court order, unless and until lifted, may not be involved in any EB-5 project. Those in the current case, the uh, resort and uh, conference center, or any other EB-5 project anywhere else. We'll take one more. Attorney General Sorrell, the U.S. Attorney, uh, Eric Miller, says he's involved in an ongoing review of both the state and SEC cases. Uh, are you, number one, are you working with him on that? And number two, is your decision not to pursue a criminal state-level investigation right now in deference to what he's doing? Uh, we've certainly been in communication uh, with uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office. I spoke to the U.S. Attorney uh, last evening. Uh, so um, we have been working together as we have been working with the U.S. Would you consider a state-level criminal case if he chooses not to go forward? I, I've said what I'm going to say, that at this juncture, no state criminal charges are contemplated, but just in the same way that other civil charges, other defendants, might result in a broadening or deepening of this case, it's entirely possible that there could be state criminal charges. Governor, will you, Governor, will you, Governor, will you release all of your emails related to this situation? Governor? Governor? Thank you. Anyone? Yeah. 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 Yeah.